So one of the questions we asked was about, do you agree or disagree with the statement that you find cybersecurity intimidating? And way too many people find it intimidating. I think the militaristic language that we tend to use, talking about attacks and defenses, and the average person, when you tell them they're being attacked, they get a fight or flight response. And if they're not a security professional, they want to run away. <laughs> they do not want to fight. Welcome to the Reimagining Cyber Podcast, where we share short and to the point perspectives on the cyber landscape. It's all about engaging yet casual conversations on what organizations are doing to reimagine their cyber programs while ensuring their business objectives are top priority. With my co-host, Stan Wisseman, Head of Security Strategists, I'm Rob Borrego, Chief Security Strategist, and this is Reimagining Cyber. So Stan, who do we have joining us for this episode? Rob, our guest today is Lisa Plagemeyer. Lisa is Interim Executive Director at the National Cyber Security Alliance. The NCSA is dedicated to building a more secure interconnected world by standing for the safe and secure use of all technology while building strong public-private partnerships designed to help educate and inspire all technology users to take action to protect themselves. Um, And I believe the NCSA, correct me if I'm wrong, Lisa, was the one that got October recognized as Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Is that right? That's right. We are the founders of Cybersecurity Awareness Month. It's great to have you with us today, Lisa. Can you start by sharing a little bit more about your background? Sure. Thanks, Stan. It's great to be here. Um, my background is actually in marketing and sales, if, if you can believe it. Um, I was actually pulled into security by a dear friend of mine who's now with Microfocus, Jim Foote. He was the chief business security officer at what used to be known as ADP dealer services. It was an automotive business that belonged to ADP, the big payroll processor that we all know. And he approached the marketing team because he wanted to do some thought leadership on security. This was back at the time when the GPAC happened and um, I think Nissan had a data breach. So we were seeing automotive manufacturers and car dealers be affected by security issues. And because we belong to ADP, we had um, a more mature security program than a lot of our competitors. And Jim wanted to do thought leadership around that and uh, help to educate manufacturers, educate dealers who were getting their bank accounts popped before the days of MFA on their bank Mm -hmm, accounts. mm -hmm. And, um, And at the time, I mean, this was going back probably 2013 or so maybe 2012, that was a pretty um, revolutionary thing to do, to want to talk about cybersecurity with your with your customers. So, um, so I got hooked. I got hooked on the subject matter, and we got spun off from ADP in 2014. And that's when Jim said, well, hey, why don't you join the security team full time? And I said, well, what would I do? I'm a marketing person, right? And he, he's said, well, you know, we're going to need help working on board presentations and incident communications. You know, somebody's got to update the executives and write communications to customers and talk tracks for employees and things like that. During Somebody incidents. who knows how to communicate. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, um, and he said, I want you to run a training and awareness program. And I said, training and awareness, what's that? And he said, you know, that stuff ADP makes us do once a year for an hour. I said, I don't want to do that. People hate that stuff. So, so he said, uh, hey, I know a, I have a friend who works at a creative agency. Let's, let's do something really different. Let's do stuff that people don't hate. And that was the beginning of my, my career in training and awareness. And I've been doing it ever since. Well, it sounds like NCSA is really lucky to have you lead this effort too, because you know, I mean, having a marketing background, you understand what it takes to get people's attention. So that's perfect. Um, what, what, I mean, again, this is a great time of year to emphasize and, and uh, amplify um, the need for everybody to be more aware about cybersecurity. Uh, if they aren't already, it's kind of surprising if they aren't because of all the things that's in the news all the time, but maybe because I'm looking for it. But what kind of resources do NCSA have uh, to help people become more aware? We, we literally have resources for people from all walks of life. I like to say we have content for my kids and we have content for my mom. So we are here to try and demystify some very complex issues for the general public to be, um, to be that resource that is, is plain spoken, puts things in terms everybody can understand, gives you really practical tips and advice that you can use. So for example, we have lots of tip sheets on our website 
if you go to our website these days um, for Cybersecurity Awareness Month, um, you can sign up to be a champion on staysafeonline.org. By the way, I think that's the, the world's best URL. Um, <laughs> you can sign up to be a, a champion and that'll get you all kinds of free resources. So both individuals and organizations can sign up. If you've signed up in the past, you need to sign up every year to be a champion. You get your name listed on our on our website. And then um, if, you're, if you happen to be in the position of running a training and awareness program, you get all kinds of free resources. Um, you know, uh, social media graphics that you can put on your company Slack channel, for example. Um, we have our logo there and branded guidelines around using the Cybersecurity Awareness Month logo. Sample articles on each weekly theme. We don't have any copyright or trademark on anything. You're, you're allowed to take any of our stuff and copy and paste it or edit it to fit your organization. Um, but lots of uh, tip sheets, videos, infographics, things like that. Now, Lisa, you know, you've had quite the experience, right, coming across different cyber awareness programs, both on the public sector and private sector, uh, not, not to mention, right, the, the specific ones that you've actually built out yourself. Now, when you look at it, right, and I've seen many different successful approaches, some maybe not so successful, but one of the ways it seems to resonate and, and, and really have some good outcomes is where you really can gamify things, right, and, and truly get the engagement back from the employees versus kind of the example you shared before with Jim, right? Which is, oh, remember that thing we have to do once a year for one hour that we kind of dread, dread doing and we don't really absorb anything going through that training. So thinking about the different programs you come across, again, even if it's examples that you've done yourself, it'd be great for the listeners to hear some examples that you can share of really just what works out there. Yeah, one of the things that I was faced with initially when we um, were spun off from ADP was I, I need to pick a vendor, right? You've got to have some, some training of some sort to at least meet your compliance obligations. And um, we looked at phishing platforms then too. The, the simulated phishing platforms are a relatively new thing. But one of the vendors at the time, I believe they still have us as well, had um, a pretest that you could give to your employees. And if they scored over a certain percentage on specific topics, then they would test out of training, further training on those specific topics. Mm -hmm. So I took a look at that and realized that just that pretest alone, there was enough sort of education baked into that pretest that that would take care of my, my compliance obligation, just having people take that pretest. So we used a little reverse psychology when we served this up to the employees. We said, hey, you know, it, rather than saying to people, you know, eat your vegetables, right? Like, yeah, we all hated that one hour compliance training from ADP, but, you know, we have to do it anyway. So here goes. We kind of owned it. We owned the fact that we knew that people didn't like that stuff. And so we said, hey, we're not going to do things the way our old parent company used to do them. Um, we're going to give you all a pretest. And if you test out of these topics, you won't have to take any training at all. And so, of course, people raced to do that. <laughs> they, they went and took their pretest because we kind of used some reverse psychology the way we, the way we sold that. Um, and so then I would get people who maybe missed by one question, one point or something, and they would want to talk about the, you know, hey, I don't think this question was worded correctly or, you know, this wasn't fair or, you know, I think the right answer is X because of Y. And um, that was just more engagement. That actually got, you know, some of, the, some of the people who read too much into some of those questions tend to be more technical. And so what that did was open up a, a communication channel with some of the engineers in the security operations center and our, you know, uh, garden variety technical folks that, you know, every SaaS company has. So that was, um, that was actually a blessing in disguise because it got us, it got us as a security team interacting with the general population, employee population that had those kinds of questions around that training. Um, and then everything else I did wasn't mandatory. Um, we, we used a creative agency to produce some really funny live action videos. Had I made those mandatory, they wouldn't have been funny anymore. You can't mandate humor. You can't mandate. True people engaging with your content. You have to serve up content, whether it's awareness content or training, that truly is engaging. And guess what? The judge of whether or not it's engaging is, 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 the, is the employee. It's not you. You can do your best to create something that you think is engaging, but if your audience doesn't think it's engaging, then, then you've actually failed. 
So, um, so you've got to, you've got to produce the best stuff you can and, and, um, and try and hit that mark. Um, but I, I think that reverse psychology that we use was, was super effective that first year. And, um, and then I used, I borrowed a, a tactic out of my marketing days. And when we did live action video content, um, we produced a whole series. So we had a, a number of episodes and we had all the related assets that would go with it. So we had banners for our internet site, our security portal. We had images for the company newsletter. We were just constantly reinforcing that same message over and over and over again. Think about it when a company launches a new product. It's on billboards, it's on TV, it's, it's on Facebook, it's everywhere you turn. And so we made sure to keep, to keep pounding on the same drum over and over and over again, um, because you're competing for share of mind with everything that's in somebody's life. You're not just competing with anything else that's in that company newsletter. You're not just competing with other content that's on your company portal. You're competing with you know, their kid's soccer game and what they're gonna make for dinner that night and the errands they have to run and all the other projects they have to do and the you know, presentation that has a deadline and things like that. You're competing with everything in their, in their head. So you, to cut through the clutter, um, you've got to have really engaging content and you've got to keep, keep that drumbeat going over and over again. In, in general, it's, I think it's fair to say that unfortunately we, we see you know, in news items about cybersecurity breaches and ransomware all the time. I mean, is the general awareness translating into better security practices? And, and you know, as far as what people are, uh, you know, that they understand, they see it all the time as far as the impact, their, their, you know, their PI, their personal information has been disclosed yet again in another data breach. Um, they know about a company that has been held ransom or their city is being held ransom. Do they, does that translate into them being more aware and taking action themselves? I think it translates into awareness. But I'm not so sure it's translating into behavior change yet. Mm. I, I see it, I, I see some more large technology companies that are implementing things that can be perceived as friction to the user. So more and more companies implementing multi-factor authentication, uh, not waiting for the user to, to turn it on, um, but just making it a part of the process. I see more and more of that happening. And I think that's a, that's a good thing. I'd love to get to the point where uh, somebody goes to sign on to something and there's no MFA and they say, hey, why isn't there, M <laughs> why isn't there MFA? Right. Well, why isn't this technology company keeping me secure? Um, but we are seeing more things like that um, happen. I mean, we just had a, a recent announcement. I think it was um, Amazon that's offering free multi-factor authentication and, and free end user training. So that, I mean, that's a huge, huge move. Um, on, you know, one of the biggest technology companies that's also consumer facing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So I think the more companies do things like that, um, the more people will start to see it as the new normal. I think there was a point where um, every kind of technology company was afraid of any kind of user friction at all. And security is, is, is frequently interpreted as, as friction. Um, but I think the scales are starting to tip a little bit more. I hope so. Um, interestingly enough, we have some research that we've just done and, and people, um, people see themselves as when we ask them, who's, who's ultimately responsible for, you know, your data, uh, people overwhelmingly say that they are, they feel a sense of individual responsibility, but that's not quite translating into, into as much behavior change as we'd like to see, not quite yet, but I feel like we're getting to a tipping point there. Well, Lisa, you're hitting upon something I'd like to get into a little bit, but before we do that, you also hit upon another thing that, that kind of hit home when you mentioned um, when someone gets to the point of them, you know, bringing up a new app and saying, geez, why, why is not asked me for the option to do MFA? And so on my end, for example, my teenage son just has his own account. We just opened, you know, for, for some work he did over the summer. So he's got a little checking account going and whatnot. He's got his mobile app for the credit union. And he's like, dad, you know that thing you told me about for these other apps, like the credit union doesn't have it. I'm like, what? Let me, let me look at this with you. Right. And it's, but it's just that he's getting it as a, you know, an right. individual. He's not into cyber, believe me, because I asked him, you want to go do cyber for school? He's like, no, not interested. All right. <laughs> but still 
he gets the point. So it's, it's, it's just a real world example. You would just share to hit me when you mentioned it as an example yeah, that's, to me the other day. That's a fantastic story. That's exactly what I'm describing. I, I think people start to wonder. Um, I, and actually it's kind of funny. I did a, um, uh, I moderated a panel here a month or two ago about um, zero trust. And there were actually some astute users in this one particular company's example who said, hey, wait a minute, you didn't do enough to authenticate me. <laughs> and the security team had to say, yes, but wasn't that nice? Wasn't that a great experience? Because we've implemented zero trust. So um, yeah, that can cut both ways. I think, you know, I don't know about your, I don't want to disparage your son's credit union, but, um, but when I do presentations to employees of different organizations, especially during the month of October, when they ask us to speak, um, I'm not afraid to tell people if your bank doesn't offer multi-factor authentication, you might want to think about getting another bank. Yeah. It's, it's really yeah. that critical. Yeah. No kidding. Absolutely. Now, one of the things you, you, you were just touching upon a little while ago as well, I want to kind of get into is around the survey that uh, the NCSA has recently conducted. I know it's in the works now to come out uh, mainstream, but um, you know, you, you, you kind of hit a little bit of some of the um, findings within it, but maybe you can kind of double click in a little bit, you know, what stood out the most, if you will, of just the kind of perception of cybersecurity for the kind of normal individual citizen out there? I think um, one of the things that, that surprised me the most, I find password managers to be incredibly helpful. We have a family account with one and when your kids go off to college and you're trying to share accounts, you know, whether it's their, some of their student accounts to pay their tuition bill or whatever it is. Um, I just find them to be incredibly handy. And, and once you get set up, they can actually save you time, right? Because they can, they can come up with a, a long random password a lot faster than I can when I'm creating a new account somewhere. So, um, so I found them to be incredibly helpful. And we actually found that of the people who don't use password managers, very, very few people do, too few people, most of them don't trust them with their passwords. They actually think it the safest way to store your passwords is to write them down. So that was pretty discouraging. I mean, that's just a complete myth. I think people just don't understand how password managers work. There's been a couple of breaches in that space. And so maybe they don't understand that, you know, by and large, those are all those passwords are encrypted. Mm -hmm. um, but all it took was that one little bit of bad PR for that industry. And now suddenly people don't trust password managers. Right. Right. Yeah. You know? Now, now looking at the survey results, I know you're just completing it and probably still doing analysis, but did you find that people were, um, the respondents were prioritizing security as far as their online presence? So one of the things we found, you know, we asked a few questions like, you know, do you agree with the statement, I prioritize security or my online security is important to me? And when you add together the people that agree and strongly agree, the, the numbers are actually pretty encouraging. Um, one of the problems though, is that we don't see the behavior change that goes along with it. Um, I think one of the numbers that surprised me the most after the password manager myth was, um, that people see themselves as the least responsible entity for their employer's information. So you ask them about their own information and who's responsible to safeguard that. And by and large, they say themselves, when you ask them about their employer's information, they choose everything else but themselves. So they, they, they say things like, you know, the organization itself, the IT department, the security department, uh, the government was a very popular answer. Um, and that could be maybe because, and this is just my theory, the more this stuff hits the news, the more uh, we read and hear about how much of this is actually um, nation state. I think that's when the, your average consumer starts to think, well, if, if, if we're being attacked by another country, then that's the, you know, the government should play a role in, in defending us. Um, but those were the, those were the highlights. People, people feel like it's a priority. They'll say it's a priority. <laughs> then you ask those same people, you know, do you use multi-factor authentication? Do you use a password manager? You ask them about their actual specific behaviors and habits. Do you back up your data? Things like that. And they're, they're less likely to say that they do those things. So and, and a lot Lisa, of good feelings. I, I'd like a little more action, though. Lisa, I just want to inject in there for those listeners that haven't listened to the episode with Michael Eccles, um, where, where he reflects on his book, the government's there, not going to save you. Um, <laughs> if, if you think the government's going to protect you, think again. Very true. Now, one more thing on the 
survey that I thought was interesting, and you, you're kind of touching upon it as we've been going through some of the, the, uh, the discussion here, is identifying those barriers of adopting just good security hygiene and things like MFA, um, other things called outright back, backups and things of that nature. But when you look at, right, so you've gotten all this data, you've been going through kind of what the results are, you, you're, you're sharing some of those things. But when you look at the barriers themselves, you know, what was your reaction and the types of responses you're seeing in these things that are basically kind of bubbling up as being really the key barriers? I, I think we're our own worst enemies in, this, in the security mm-hmm. community. A lot of times we, we make it confusing. We use, so one of the questions we asked was about whether or not you find it um, do you agree or disagree with the statement that you find cybersecurity intimidating? And way too many people find it intimidating. And I think that's, um, there's two things at work there. I think the militaristic language that we tend to use talking about attacks and defenses and, and you know, the average person, when you tell them they're being attacked, they get a fight or flight response. And if they're not a security professional, they want to run away. <laughs> they do not want to fight. So when you use those terms in your training program um, and you you know you make people feel like they're they're your first line of defense you know that's not why they come to work every day they come to work every day to do their jobs not to not to fight cyber mm-hmm. criminals mm-hmm. Um, so I think I think all that language that we've used for so long and the imagery that we've used for so long the hackers and the hoodies and the security companies with color palettes that are black and red and um, just that whole sort of aggressive aggressive, tone that just doesn't appeal to your average person. And that, that, that can be intimidating. And then I think language in general, um, using terms like multi-factor authentication, you know, we're not doing ourselves any favor, any favors with that, term, with that terminology. That's, that's just, um, your average person has no idea what that means. That also came out in the research. You know, marketers would use words like quick and easy and simple and, and, optimism, like peace of mind. I had somebody tell me lately, it was a a designer that I've worked with for a long time on a number of different training products. And um, we decided to to not use any hackers and hoodies, no militaristic language, none of that stuff. And um, we're, you know, designing this whole series, this whole product. And as we were talking about password managers one day, he said, you know, Lisa, I've been working with you for a couple of years. And I finally did it. I finally sat down and signed up and got a password manager. And um, he said, you know, it took a little bit of time, but, but now I've got peace of mind. I just don't even worry about this stuff anymore. And that was a light bulb moment for me because we don't, we're not selling peace of mind like we should be, right? Instead of, instead of selling this idea that you're under attack and you need to do something about it. Um, what about selling optimism? What about selling, you know, being, having worry-free passwords on your, on your accounts or worry-free security? No, that's um, a, that's a great point. I mean, my 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 father uses who's eighty eight uses a password manager. It's one of those. Um, it's not an online version. It's actually a, a a device where he's able to plug it all in, and he it does have peace of mind. Um, and is frustrated that his my mom his wife will not use it <laughs> <laughs> because he has that peace of mind and wants to have peace of mind regarding her passwords. <laughs> well, maybe so. she needs to listen to the podcast. That's right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you mentioned that, you you know, NCSA has a lot of great res- resources, right? Ranging from kids to your mom. And that's great. But if you, if you look at small businesses that may not even have documented a, a security policy yet, um, how would you recommend them getting started? You know, that's interesting. You mentioned policies because I, I did a, an event a year or two ago. And um, one of the things that came up, one of the questions that came in during the presentation was, I don't have any security policies. So how can I, you know, my organization doesn't have policies. How can I possibly start a training and awareness program? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, that just made me (laughs) kind of sad. And um, my answer was to the, was a question to the bad guys care that you don't have policies. Are they, are they just not going to attack you until your policy is finished? Like, how does that work? Right, I'm, right. I'm pretty sure they don't care. So you can, inertia can be such a killer, right? Like just getting started is, is the key and not letting uh, perfection be the enemy of good is one of my favorite phrases. So you don't need policies. You don't need a security plan. You don't need a mature program. You just need to get started. And, and there's things like phishing that affect everybody that you can easily train on. Um, there's tons of free content out there. 
you know, both from the National Cybersecurity Alliance and a lot of the vendors in the space have free versions for small businesses. Um, I will put in a plug for a small business program um, that we've run in the past and we're, we're gonna be making some changes to it and cranking it back up again in, in the future. We kind of got derailed with COVID, um, but it's a, it's a workshop called Cybersecure My Business and it's specifically for small business people. Um, and we, again, we demystify cybersecurity. We use terms that the business owner can understand. And usually if they bring their IT person, when, when we did these in person before COVID, the IT guy is there shaking his head, you know, nodding his head saying, you know, I, I told my boss this stuff, <laughs> but he doesn't <laughs> listen. But it's just a matter of giving it, you know, feeding the information to the business owner in a way that they understand as a, as a business person. Um, so we'll be, we'll be starting, restarting that series virtually again soon. And what I'm hoping to do is go down different industry verticals so that, because we have oh, it is an actual workshop. Yeah. So if we have a, a workbook that's specific to people like for example in my past life in the automotive industry we could do a version that's specific to car dealers like how would you protect your you know what are the assets you're trying to protect and right. it's just a NIST-based five-step program with a workbook and some breakout sessions and um you know we could try it in the hospitality industry with like franchisees um or you know small rural hospitals things like that so we're actually in the process of looking for um companies and, and industry organizations who would want to partner on that to help us um, get the word out to small businesses because they really do they really do need the, the help and you know all of us in the industry know if you just if you take a few simple steps and just get started um, you know then you're not the unlocked door on the block right the bad yeah, guys and, 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 un and unfortunately these ransomware attacks just don't care who you are if you have weaknesses right. they'll exploit it yeah exactly and you just uh, like a friend of mine likes to likes to say, you don't have to unru uh, outrun the bear; you just have to outrun your buddy. So, <laughs> very true. Well, I think um, Lisa, you, you've shared some really great insights and different topics around cyber awareness and kind of approaches. I love the example you just shared around. You know, this is what I've been telling my boss, but maybe it's the way you're explaining it to boss. Maybe it's the terminology that you're using. Kind of as you mentioned earlier, right? in, in cybersecurity, we, we've done a tremendous job at marketing things from a fear, uncertainty, doubt perspective. It helps no Absolutely. one at all, right? Yeah, way, way too much fun. Exactly. And so to your point about, you know, change the terminology, the approach, and it really should make a major difference, especially when, you know, at a business level, you're engaging with the different business line owners, the executives, um, but also you called out another area that, and unfortunately at times it's, um, people may look at it with the small businesses as the cost of doing cybersecurity services, buying different solutions, trying to implement them. It's complex. It's costly. Well, there's actually a lot of simple things that you can do to get started, as you mentioned, and they need to take advantage of those things. And you guys have such great different resources to be able to provide the right guidance and help them do that. And some of the things you guys are planning to do just from a vertical or oriented perspective, I think is just tremendous. So thanks for coming on and sharing all the great things that you guys are doing, the background and how you got to this point from marketing all the way over to what you've been doing today, which is in my point of view, still marketing and doing it the right way. So we really appreciate you sharing. Thank you very much. Stay safe online. Thanks for listening to the Reimagining Cyber Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you would like to have us cover a specific topic of interest, feel free to reach out to us and you can find out how in the show notes. And don't forget to subscribe. This podcast was brought to you by CyberRes, a micro-focused line of business, where our mission is to deliver cyber resilience by engaging people, process, and technology to protect, detect, and evolve.